I'm Judd Myers. I'm Scott Tipton. Welcome to Blast Off. There are some guests who need very little introduction, some who have affected our industry in so many ways that it would require a dedicated program just to list their achievements. Mark Wade is that guest. He's written nearly every comic book character at nearly every comic book company, quite a few that he founded himself. He's become an expert at every level of publishing, owner, CEO, CCO, editor-in-chief, digital pioneer. And of course, a relentless wordsmith, creating original characters and transforming long-existing ones with brave and bold strokes. Over 30 years of shaping and reshaping so many of the heroes and villains whose adventures we long to daydream about, he builds the ship. He fills it with a crew, and then he pilots it and makes sure we all have a seat right up front. He's a quiet man who can also wield a big stick. A man with strong opinions, which means a man with as many enemies as friends. He does not back down. He does not cower. He does not lie. He speaks his mind and types with his heart and his fingers. In this transparency lies the key to the emotional core that sets his comic book writing aflame. I've known him a long time, and he's the same human being now as he was when we first met. Maybe a bit wiser, (laughs) skin a bit thicker. He's not a man without fear. He's a man unafraid to walk through it and see what happens next. Like I said, I'm not going to list his credits. (laughs) If you don't know who he is, hit pause and open your browser. Type in the name Mark Wade and give yourself a few minutes to cover the terrain of his career so far. When you pick your jaw up off the floor, press play and prepare for a master class in honesty from a master storyteller. I'm joined by extraordinary writer and editor and historian, Mark Wade. Right. You forgot publisher and retailer. Okay, publisher and retailer. Former retailer? Well, former retailer, but still. <laughs> Congratulations. I've, I've, been, I've been in the trenches for a couple of, Yes, exactly, yes. So I've been wanting to do this for a long time. We're, we're close friends, and usually it's either very difficult mm-hmm. or very easy to interview your close friends. I can see that. Partly because you know so much about one another. Right. And you want to show intimacy, but you also don't want to reveal too much because it's confidences. Also at the same time, you're doing a podcast. You have to ask certain questions for the audience that you know the answer for already. So you see, I was just fishing for that. Yes. I'm glad you said it and not me. (laughs) I've I've been around this I've been around this rodeo before. A few interviews. Yes. Um so okay. I'm going to avoid some of the things that other people normally hit you with and uh, and maybe some that you know you've, you've right. already answered, but I'll know what the road answers are. You can tell because you can see the string come out of my back. It's <laughs> like a C and say. <laughs> but I'm also going to uh, jettison what I normally do with my format. All right, because there's just too much ground to cover. All right, and it is really sort of you've done a lot of things in a, a lot of different uh, with a lot of different angles. Mm-hmm. Not just in this industry. Right. But I do want to um, begin, like I always do, uh, which is many people already know the first comic book you ever read Mm -hmm. because you've talked about it quite a bit. But please uh, inform everyone once again what that was. Absolutely. The Batman TV show comes on, 1966, Mm -hmm. and my dad sees that I'm interested, so he goes and buys the first Batman comic he can find. It's one of the very first ones that comes out after the TV show. It's Batman number 180. And it is Batman and Robin versus Death Man, a big guy in a skeleton <laughs> costume. And I, you know, looking back, it may not be the best crafted comic in the world, but I didn't care. It just, it changed everything for me. That was the lightning rod. And then ever since then, I've been reading comics. And even after I discovered girls, I've been reading. I never went through that phase of, well, you know, I got in high school, I kind of let it drop off. And then I got back. I never went through that phase. So you always dated girls. I always dated girls. Exactly. Either they were okay with it or, you know, forget it. Either they knew who the Red Skull was. <laughs> Or they were okay with that diner scene where like you you put the girl in the room and they answer the football question. You have to answer every single one of these. Exactly. Green Goblin is who. Right. And where did he get it? 
Did he buy it at a drugstore, a newsstand? Newsstand, I guess. I mean, honestly, I, I don't remember. I was four, maybe three, probably three. And you remember this and you were reading when yep. you were three or four I years was, old. I was very lucky. Until I was like seven or eight, I was an only child. And my parents, my mother in particular, and my grandmother in particular, her mother, really got with me and started teaching me to read at a very early age. And I can't swear that I understood every word at that age, but I certainly understood what I would, how exciting it was to look at and a lot of the, a lot of the, the words. And I, I got, I, by the time I was four or five, I was reading newspapers. I was, mm. I was a pretty sharp little kid. But obviously you had a TV in the house because the Batman TV show was yeah. happening. Yeah, so it wasn't one of those f- Skinner box families where, <laughs> you know, where uh, no television and movies for him. He's going to well, read I don't Shakespeare. Know. You're in the religious South. That's you're, true. You know, who knows what yeah. it was like. That's true. I mean, were your parents religious? Were oh, they? man. Yeah. Well, I think it was more a sense of obligation on their part because mm. that's what people did in the South. But mm-hmm. it was, I mean, it was tent revivals, man. It was tent revivals and snake handlers and all that stuff. And it's just... I, to this day, I am really just not interested in set foot in the church. Mm. Um, I'm not a terribly spiritual man because yeah. of this. I, and again, that's not an issue. It's not a problem. You know, I, I'm not a spiritual man, and yet I wrote Kingdom Come. So, <laughs> right. um, but I think that was. I, I think that's what got drilled into me was that there's there's social obligations. There are things that you have to do when you're. You know, when you're a standard Southern family, you have to do this. And that's what I drove away from as soon as I could. So you went to church every Sunday? Yes. So and you had, well, how many siblings did you have? Uh, I had none until seven, seven that my sister was born. Mm-hmm. And then we, you know, then again, we all got hauled off to, you know, the Baptist church. And, right. And not just, and again, Thursday tent revival meetings, man, because I would always miss the back half of Batman. It would piss me off. <laughs> What, you didn't record it? I, uh, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> Welcome to the six, I would live in the 16th century, yes. Um, and your your sister, um, you guys, you didn't always live together. Your family didn't always stay together. Was, right. We, yeah, my parents, you know, as most parents do, mm. you know, my parents split when I was eight, I want to say, nine, mm-hmm. nine probably. Um, big, on, big surprise to us. I mean, literally my mother just said, get in the car. <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> and we drove, and I will never forget this. We drove, and her first stop was a convenience store, and she said, stay in the car. And she goes in, and she comes out, and she's smoking cigarettes. Now, I've never seen my mother smoke in my entire life up to that point. But she was just huffing and puffing, and she was like, I'm, you know, I'm free. I can do what I want. And good on her. Mm-hmm. So she's the one who decided to go. And that's, I, that's not a, that alone is not a knock against my father. Just yeah. These people clearly were not meant to be together so we stayed with my mother for a year or so mm-hmm. it wasn't really working out she i was a latchkey kid it's the deep south in the in the like the late 60s early 70s so there's not many opportunities for women in the workplace obviously right right so she's working you know two two and a half jobs and i'm home all alone my sister's home i'm taking care of my sister and it, it was a lot of responsibility but at the same time i don't regret that for one second because it I got to be a grown up pretty early on. Hmm. I was already born 20 years old and then I, you know, reading and stuff. And then I, by the time I got to that age, I pretty good head on my shoulders in terms of what you're responsible for and what you're, you know, what is a good thing to do or what a bad things to do in terms of your family and what you, what you owe other people. And you're close with your sister? Not anymore. Not, not because of any friction. It's just that when I left, home you know she was still there for a few years and Mm -hmm. we kind of fell off and then she grew up to be a young republican you know Uh and and god bless her but we just have nothing to talk about i Mm. love her to death and she loves me we we we, we talk like every two or three years and your parents uh it's uh my my mom passed away about 20 years ago Mm -hmm. we weren't terribly close when i was in college it's just that post high school college area not for any reason again none of this is because I hate these people. Mm-hmm. I left home 15, I guess. I mean, mm-hmm. I was I was accelerated in school. I lived, you know, I, I got bumped up a couple of grades as I went, which again, I would not recommend to anyone because <laughs> you get to be the runt by the time you get to a junior in high school, you know, the 13 year old who can't drive or drink or anything and mm-hmm. become, and, and so, so I left home just 
really couldn't get along with my stepmother. That was the biggest part of it. Mm-hmm. Went to college right away. Dumb idea again, but it's not like I could backpack across Europe. I'm 15 years old. So and this was in Virginia. Yeah, I was living in Virginia at that time. We moved from the deep South to Virginia for my dad's job. He worked at Gulf Oil. And we worked there. For, we you know we moved there in '76, I guess. Yeah. So somewhere along in there. Did he pay for your education? Uh, no. So uh, you paid your way through, or did you get scholarships? I scholars- because there are two things to bear in mind. First off, I, I did get scholarships. Secondly, it's talking about getting into college in the late '70s. It wasn't that expensive, and it was a commuter school. It was mm-hmm. it was Virginia Commonwealth University, which is a giant school in in Virginia and in Richmond, but it's also the world's largest commuter college because there, at that time, there was no student housing. Mm. So, you know, you just, the expenses of living there were not that great. The expenses of going, I don't remember what it was. I want to say that I got a thousand dollars a semester as a scholarship and that covered stuff. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck sending your daughter to college. Oh yeah, I know. She's already (laughs) talking about it. She's like, you know, she's 15. She's like, I want to go to NYU like mom. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. The most expensive university in America. I did not know that. $75,000 a year. <gasps> and that is without housing and books. But luckily, you're in comic book retail. Yeah. So I'm rolling. You're swimming in it. So I figure I've got a couple of years to just, you know, rustle up in Action Comics number one. <laughs> right. And a Detective 27. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm yeah, all good. You're set. Everything is great. Yeah. Your daughter's smart as a whip. She'll do well in the scholarship field. I think so. I think she'll do fine. And she's still got a couple of years to change her mind. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> you leave brochures for, you know, SoCal around all the place. Yeah. I'm going to come back to this. All right. Cause, because I want to jump back to this Batman 180, which I brought with me oh, today. Oh, good man. Um, I, I, I purposely put it upside down because right. if you had even seen one little quarter yes. of it, the corner, you would know exactly what it was. And not just because it was my first comic. Right. As, as you've it's, seen in your store. Oh, I have everybody. You all know this. But for those who don't, I have held up a comic book from, we're talking, you know, a thousand square feet. From one side to another, a tiny corner, a checkered corner of a Silver Age comic book. Mark, at the door, shouts out what it is. It's Adventure 355 it's or whatever ridiculous. it is. Yeah, I know. I it's know. ridiculous. It's, it's my magic trick. That's but it. Yeah. if I say, where are your keys, Mark? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what is your senator's name? <laughs> I, uh, yeah. But I brought it here because I want to look at it. All right. I'm taking out of the my light right That now. is a nice sharp copy. Yes, it is. I have one framed above my desk. Of course you do. That's the one that you didn't give us when we were selling. You know, That's the comics, one comic. That's which, right. by the way, we're still doing. So yes. if you would like to buy some of Mark Wade's personal collection, please go to blastoffcomics.com and rifle around a bit. Not all of it is on there because there's a lot of it and our site would break if we put it all on there. But people send us lists. You can feel free to send us lists, ask if we have, likely we do, and we can communicate with you directly about it. you got 45 years of comics. That's a <laughs> lot of alphabetical comics. Alphabetical hundred, numeric order. Yeah, 100 long boxes. <laughs> okay, so putting that aside yeah. for now, our public service announcement, we're looking at Batman 180 right now, and we're probably going to put some stuff on the site. We'll do some scans so you can see inside of it. And the first thing that we see is Superman on television. Oh, yes. There's an ad for that, and it says, now featured on the following television stations, and it shows a list, handwritten, of city and station all across the country. Los Angeles is KTTS. For all of you who remember KTTF. <laughs> but it's all across the country. And uh, uh, imagine, imagine seeing this. You're, all right. But do you, what city is not on that list? Of course, I have no idea. Birmingham, Alabama, where I grew up. You're kidding. No. I didn't see that show until I was like 15. I didn't see that show until the movie came out. So you opened this and looked at it and, and looked for your... Longed. <laughs> you longed God. to see Superman on television. <laughs> not. A, that is torture. I know. We'll get to Palisades Park in a minute, but yes, that's <laughs> that that was also torture. But yes, this was torture. So death knocks three times. Yep, um, and and obviously this is May of nineteen sixty six. So it was this on sale in early March, yep. so right after, and it sold like a million copies, which really? nothing was. Uh, Julie Schwartz was the editor. It was a Julie Schwartz was Ray Bradbury's first agent, hmm. um, and um, um, Lovecraft's last agent, and. 
he went into comics and a young man in like 43, 44 and edited the rest of his life. And so he was, he was an innovative man. And, um, how did I get on this? What were we were saying? We were, uh, <laughs> Hey, tell me about it. I could prick a comic yeah, right you, now. Know, you I, tell I, me exactly about it. The first appearance of parasite, but oh, I know what it was. I know what it was <laughs> that Julie's that Julie was a genius when it came to picking the right people on comics and making them saleable. Right. That uh, Julie used to keep a record. DC used to keep a record of what, the print run was and what the sell through was to newsstands and so forth. And if you got like a, if you got newsstands to sell like 60 or 70% of your print run, mm. boom, then that was a, that was a good comic. These issues of Batman sold 97 and 98% of their, of their print run. Wow. Jewel, before that justice league, number one, which Jewel, also Julie's purview. Mm-hmm. This is like 62 sold about 94% of its print run, something like that. Now, what, what was the print run back then, you think? Oh, somewhere in the neighborhood of a million, <laughs> a little over, a, a hair. I think the Batmans were a hair over a million. I think the Justice Leagues were in the 800,000s. So you get a call from Marvel when your new issue of Champions comes out, and they're like, okay, so like you didn't hit a million. <laughs> no, like, no, what's, what's, the, what's wrong with you? I the, know. <laughs> Where's Julie Schwartz? Well, I didn't have Julie Schwartz as my editor. There you go. <laughs> oh, if Julie Schwartz were alive today, he would change the entire industry. So Figure my point, it all yeah. out. So my point being, this is yeah. this is a Julie. The Batman TV show was obviously a big help, but also Julie just knew how to put knew how to put together an attractive comic book. And for all of you who are rifling through our backlog of podcasts, you can hear my podcast about breaking into Julie's office when I was a kid and um, demanding that he change Green Lantern. It's you, a whole lot of fun. It's like the early internet for you. <laughs> Okay, so in this, it's fantastic. We obviously have Bruce Wayne with a lot of uh, you know beautiful women all around him who are saying "ooh," and this crazy villain shows up, of course, yep. and immediately we have Batman and Robin on the side of a building, absolutely, right? because you have. I mean, because TV it's show, the TV show, and they have to climb down the side of it, you know, do you know, their twists and turns and acrobatic skills on the flagpoles of which there are many on the side of this building. There are more flagpoles in (laughs) comics than there are in all of New York city. Every time I go to New York, I look for flagpoles on the side of the building. It's not that many. Okay. So there's a great sequence where Batman and Robin are again, bam, crack, pow, sock. That's okay. It's all in one, you know, half panel of a page where they're fighting the henchmen and it ju- it's it is the TV show. I mean it just looks just like the TV show. The only thing that could have made it more like the TV show if the henchmen had their name stitched across the front of their shirts. <laughs> but yes, there was time for that. And this is the greatest thing in these comics. So they, you know, they give you a few pages and then there's a break. We have a little break and we have a little ad or we have a strip or something like that. In this case, you know, teaching kids how to stack matchboxes together to make little drawers. And we have direct current. Oh, my God. It's like the TV guide of comics. By popular demand. The feature you've asked for. Yes. (laughs) Yes. And which one was that? The direct current. Yeah, exactly. That was that dude. I they talk about Lois Lane and Captain Hunter and all the amazing that's comics that smart marketing on there but that didn't exist before the batman tv show and then they say well we're going to sell comics because of the batman tv show let's sell them more comics right like yeah. the greatest group of goof ups in comic history merry man the dumb bunny the blimp awkward man and the white feather that's right this is showcase 62 this is so <laughs> just in case you were wondering i didn't look so and they have a page that's health myths debunked so it's sort of a, you know, sort of like, you know, let's let you know what, true or false, does this really work? Putting a, a steak, a piece of raw meat should be used to treat a black eye. I'm not even going to tell you the answer. You're going to have to go look You're it gonna up. You're going to have to go look. <laughs> I learned a lot. To this day, I don't rub frostbite with snow as a, as a, <laughs> as a remedy. Yeah. Lucky you, you learned it here yeah. in these pages. And then the story can, it picks up. Yeah. It continues. It was, conti- with- it was continued after page three. After third, continue on third page following and put a pin in that because we're going to come back to that in a while. Okay. All right. So we start again. Yeah. And yet again, Bruce Wayne is here surrounded by beautiful women. As he is. Because you got to start you yeah. know, every section with, with that. And of course, the story continues. There's, you know, graveyard and, and headstones. And Bruce is having these terrible nightmares where the villain is laughing at him and telling him he's a loser. Yeah. And, uh, 
he's never going to win. So being so wound up by this, this awful night that he's had, he decides... Let's go scuba diving in Jamaica. Of course. <laughs> There's a criminal on the loose in Gotham City. What better way? <laughs> and of course, he's surrounded, surrounded by, by beautiful women. women. Yeah. And they're listening to a little radio yeah. on the beach and they're, you know, dancing. And, you know, Robin's like, he's going scuba diving. I'm sure it was that and- fake rock and roll that TV put, <laughs> that old men on TV put on 60 TV shows that they thought was like rock and roll. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fabulous. Yeah. And they get into the bat copter. They're flying around in the bat copter. And then we have a break. Yes. First, they do another ad for Inferior 5 because they really want people they to They really inferior push. Inferior. As a, and, of course, they become legends since. Every, right. every right. child and every, every household knows who the Inferior 5 is. The strip, Casey mm-hmm. the Cop. And then an ad for Cheerios. Rocky and Bullwinkle. Rocky and Bullwinkle endorsing Cheerios. Endorsing Cheerios. The only difference is back then they actually put little strawberries in them. That's true. So <laughs> they were good back then. They were, yes. Until they just became little circles of cardboard. Yes. Um, things you give babies. That's what they are. <laughs> things you give babies to keep them happy. We have a Cheerios ad. And then back to the, back to the show. Mm-hmm. And Batman, you know, on top of a car and the henchman and at the junkyard. And, you know, our villain who is more henchman again. Mm-hmm. And they're fighting, and they're upside down, and they're, they're, this is great. The dialogue is fantastic. A lot of ha-ha-has. <laughs> yeah. And then we have a couple more ads for mail-away magnets. Mm-hmm. Only 79 cents post-paid. I longed for those magnets. Did you really? I really did. <laughs> did. Knowing you, you would long for them, and even if you had the money, you wouldn't want to cut up the... Right. Cut up my comic. Right. Right. Dial H for hero. Will, you'll put that. You'll put a picture on your site. Yes, absolutely. This was my favorite comic book character growing up, and to this day, he's one of my favorite comic book characters. Robbie Reed. Robbie Reed. Dial H for hero. The gimmick was he's a genius kid who falls into a cave and he finds this alien phone dial, basically, <laughs> and he dials the letters H E R O and he becomes a hero for like a short amount of time. Right. First off, that's cool because. I could just grab a phone and pretend to be Robbie Reed. I didn't have to come from Krypton. <laughs> I didn't have to grow up in Atlantis. Anybody can find a phone dial. And secondly, this, and I can send you pictures. This is exactly what I look like when I was a kid. Oh, you'll send me pictures. I will send you pictures. That is exactly <laughs> I what I want like to when see I was a kid. that. The boy who can change into a thousand superheroes. Yep. Okay. Well, how come you never did the ultimate? Robbie Reed. I did. We did an event called the Silver Age back uh-huh. in like 2000, okay. which right. no right. one remembers because it's the one big giant DC event that they never bothered <laughs> to collect and they don't, which is weird because it's Mark Millar and me and a lot of good writers attached yeah, to that yeah. thing. Uh, but it was my chance to do my ultimate Robbie Reed story. My, just my heartfelt love letter to Robbie Reed. And I did. And it was, I'm very proud of that story. And there is a collection that that story is in. No. There you go. No. Thanks, DC. Thanks, to, yeah, sorry. To be fair, DC's been very good lately about cranking out stuff with that's true. On it, so that's true. But someday, Silver Age. As a matter of fact, I'm sure they just don't think about it. I'm sure nobody has come up in a meeting and gone, you know, we've forgotten about Silver Age. So I'll put the I'll put the bug in their ear. Do and until then, I'm going to put them up on the website Do so it. that people can go and buy them. I love that story. Um, they'll be like six thousand yeah. dollars. So <laughs> <laughs> it'll be really affordable. So we got the the wild way out adventures of DC's swinging junior superheroes, the Teen Titans. And in the middle, it says Destination Cool. DC. DC. Clever. They made a lot of hay out of direct currents. DC. Yeah. 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 Don't call. (laughs) No, no, no. (laughs) Whatever you do, Wade, don't call. Don't call. And we're going to come back to calling in a while. Put a pin in that, too. We're going to come back to... (laughs) DC and phone. So we're going to come back to that. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So we're back to the story and uh, a lot of ha ha ha's again, Bruce Wayne having this nightmare. And again, our terrible villain coming and visiting him, which he's having this nightmare. The, the villain doesn't actually come and visit him. No, it's just him having this nightmare. He's about plagued it. He's by this nightmare. really scared. So what does he do? Well, he goes and Hangs out with some pretty women. <laughs> Kel Supreme. <laughs> okay, yeah. Again, this is what he does. He even looks sort of like, I don't know. Something's <laughs> really wrong. <laughs> Give me some more women. Yep. And then he discovers you know, how it is and why it is that, that this villain is, is looking dead over and over again because he's learned how to you know, fake his death. Fake his death and stop his heart. And, right. You know, and be buried alive. He fakes his death. In chapter one, Batman goes, all right, job done. 
Then in right. chapter two, he shows back up, uh, fakes his death, job taken care of. Yeah. So Death Man. Great name. Uh, come, he come, comes back to life. Death Man comes back to life. And, you know, the henchmen are shooting at Batman. They even, like, clip him on the shoulder. And this guy is, like, taking Batman. He's, mm-hmm. he's taking him down. They're about to fall into a grave. And Death Man raises his gun to, for the killing shot. And lightning strikes his gun. I, and kills him right to which batman says he was electrocuted just as surely as if he were in the electric chair his sentence was carried out <laughs> thanks batman. And in the grave yeah. he falls yep and then batman and robin just walk off yeah by the way that's the, the next to the last panel it's a, it's a <laughs> wrap up in one panel i go well i guess that's done <laughs> I I never looked at the story from this lens before, through this lens before, but Batman accomplishes nothing <laughs> in this. Nothing. Well, he there's a lot of women. That's true. And he goes That's to true. Jamaica. He does he does he does so, keep but that a is, couple of crimes from being committed. But Bruce when Rain does right, gets that. But when Batman has a gun leveled at him, his his response is to stand there and hope lightning will will strike. That's, and Robin says something like, You're not Superman. I, yeah. He said he actually has a line that says that. So uh, we have an ad that ends with Doom Patrol, mm-hmm. the w- original World's Strangest Heroes, the magazine that dares to be different. I guess you, now we have another Doom Patrol comic book. We do. Nice upselling. Yeah. You know, we got, Gerard we got Way one available in your store by Gerard Way. Yeah. Dares to be different. And then we have Letters to uh, the Batcave. Letters cave, to the Batcave. Which, <laughs> which has a line that says, we must be doing something, dash, right, W-R-I-T-E. <laughs> that's as goofy as it is. That's actually not. That's a terrible slogan, but it's a great it, philosophy. It, it really is. Yeah, yeah. It really is. And we have letters from yeah. people who, you know, dear editor, congratulations on things, and the editor responds. Your typical old fashioned letters page. And it wasn't really typical back then. I mean, Julie really? again. Julie kicked that off. It was up until the late fifties. There were, I guess, the EC Comics, mm-hmm. uh, Tales from the Crypt, and so forth. They ran some letter columns, but by and large, comics didn't run letter columns. Hmm. Until Julie came along and said, you know, we did this in the science fiction books back when uh, science fiction magazines when I was a kid. I like I'm a fan growing up. We respect fans. Let's do this. And hmm. so he kicked it off and then other books picked it up. And again, it wasn't it, it was still a fairly new at that point. That's you're really, going to get the history of comics. Yeah. Why not? We're here. Let's you know, I'm with the historian. We should. So did you immediately write letters I to did, the back? I, first of all, I could hold a crayon in my hand. I think, <laughs> um no, I, I in in the course of my uh, my comic reading, I probably sent a dozen letters, maybe. And I got, were any of them published? I got three of them published. In in ones in uh, ones in World's Finest two fifty three, uh, ones in uh, Brave and Bold one ninety four. That's like that's late. We're yeah. talking like I'm now like a teenager. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was one more, and I, God, I can't. I know I, it'll come to me. Okay, but, but yeah. And and was it really? Was oh, it a, House of Secrets ninety eight. Oh, yeah, okay. Right. And was it a congratulations letter, or was it like, listen, guys? It was. I, I found something. Uh, sadly, really- they were they were all listen, guys. <laughs> you know, Adam Strange wouldn't do that. It's, <laughs> I, yeah, I. In retrospect, I wouldn't have published those letters, but yeah. So we end with the uh, the adventures of Andy and George in the GI Joe Club. Yet another thing that you can write away for in. Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Exactly. Another thing you can cut your comic book up <laughs> right. for to cut send it a up. coupon. Yeah. Cut it up. Ah. And at the end, watch the show. Build the kit. Yeah. Batman, a great new show on ABC TV. The Aurora Kits. Yeah, the Aurora Model Kits. Mm-hmm. And it's it's pretty great because Batman zooms to the rescue. Superman crashes through a wall. Superboy and Crypto fight off a monster. And Wonder Woman battles an octopus. Battles an octopus. <laughs> <laughs> I longed for those kids, obviously. <laughs> I, I, it took me forever to find the Wonder Woman. I, I, I was like 20 before I found the Wonder Woman. It's, they, don't, they don't make them. You know? Right, right. And this Aurora's is, gone now. Like, this is a reared ritual of, of, of childhood that I kind of regret that no child deals with now. Because mm. like, you built kids didn't right, you at some right. point yeah, we all of course, did of course i did it looked terrible you've got glue everywhere yeah. you've got paint slopped on everything it looks awful it doesn't look like the box but it's but it's part of it's like it's like anything it's like eating candy it's yes. like it's what you do as a kid you know you do the whole thing and there's one piece missing know, somehow, yes. somehow there's one and there's no ebay to go no. ask somebody if they've got that one no. piece it's just you're gonna have to live with that 
and you've paid 98 cents. No, Grant, that's, I, yeah, well, for those guys, Batman was $1.49 well, okay. because he had extra pieces. Of course, yeah. of course. And because he was Batman. Yeah. This is, we just went through a really cool comic book. It is a piece of history. This, I, I wanted to do this to illustrate something. Now, I'm a traditionalist and I'm a classic comic book retailer. Um, I understand why grading happens. I understand why people put things in plastic and sell them because they get a grade and it's higher and they make more money. But for me, mm -hmm. it's like having the Beatles white album put in a piece of plastic so you can't listen to right. it. Right. Yes. There is writing, there's art, there's inking, there's hand lettering. There are these ads that show us history. Right. There are letters pages from people. There's so much inside of it that calls to, you know, uh, not just what's happening in the world, uh, our world, but also future stories. Yeah. Because as I remember, I remember as a kid reading my comics and at one point learning to read, mm -hmm. discovering that the captions actually said something yeah. that related to They're the related, action. Exactly. They weren't just filler up there. I was yeah. so excited yeah. because I got to go read my comics yep. again and have all this stuff. And the asterisks that would lead you to other things. Here's a footnote. A footnote that says, hey, this happened in Justice League last month. You should go check that out. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of those. Yeah. Without that, yeah. inside of a plastic case, certainly you could go onto the internet. Right. But, and there are scans of things. But there's just nothing like sitting at a table with your pal nope. and going through it nope. and talking about the history of it. Let me show you one more thing. It's just, I, this story has no credits. They, credit, right. Well, it's credited to Bob, Bob Kane. Kane of course, of baloney. course it is. <laughs> it's, yeah, Bob Kane, quote, created Batman, unquote. <laughs> with a guy named Bill Finger, who, if you go to Hulu right now, there's yes. a documentary, you know, Batman and Bill, yes. where they talk about Bill Finger, who was the unsung hero who helped Bob Kane and co created Batman. Mm. Um, but Bob had it in his contract that his name got to be on every story, regardless of whether he drew it or not. This was not. This is drawn by Sheldon Maldoff. Anybody mm. can see that who knows comics. But this story is written by Robert Kaniger, who was the single most prolific writer in DC history and one of the most prolific writers in comics history. Mm. No one will ever, ever, ever hit that number of stories ever again. There's not that many comics published, and we don't live long enough. Kaniger wrote a story like a day. Wow. He got on the train every morning. He would get his portable typewriter out. He would sit there. He would start typing page two, panel one. And he'd start on page two because he didn't – page one back then was like a symbolic splash page. Right. So he didn't know what that was. He didn't have a story yet. And he would just discover his stories he wrote. He'd write like a six or seven page story or 13 page Sergeant Rock story or whatever. And he'd finish was he, as the train rolled up and he'd mm. get up and go to the office and – edit and but he freelance wrote it on the side and he would give his story over to somebody and it would wow. draw it the one time it failed him and this may be an apocryphal story but i don't care it's <laughs> it's it julie schwartz told me this i julie had an imagination i don't care let's assume it's true uh julie gets a panic call julie shares an office with canager julie has a panic call one day panic call in the early part of the day it's canager he's He's trapped at the train station. <laughs> he can't leave and come upstairs because he hasn't finished his story yet. What's he going to do? And Julie had to literally come downstairs and get Kaniger and drag him back to the office. Now, that, as wild a story as that is, Kaniger actually had a, a history of sort of, and again, brilliant writer, had yeah. a history of of mental, of mental nervous breakdowns and some right, right. So it's not beyond the pale that he, this might happen to him. This is how you tell a Kaniger story every time. Kaniger had a signature, if you will. It's a, a bit that he did in every single story he wrote. And that is this three-panel progression where you do close, 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 boom, boom, boom. Right. And he does it later on in the story, too. There's, a, there's another place. But it's that's his thing. Every, every Sergeant Rock story, every story he ever wrote had somewhere in that story, there was the, the three panels across the page that was close, closer, closest as the as the action ratcheted up as you're going you know boom, have you ever boom, seen boom. his scripts does he do, yeah you know, and he explained like describes this is where the oh yeah he was a he was a nazi when it came to being a script like a writer he like you had to follow his scripts like to the letter <laughs> you had to, he got he lost his mind if you dared change a, a bit a you're tiny, the same right you i'm the same exactly just throw chairs yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
<clears throat> excuse me. Um, so, okay, this is, I love this. We, no, we spent an forever. hour on Batman yeah. 180. That's, That's fine. Okay. Um, I don't care. I don't, I got time. <laughs> I'm going to edit it all out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, my, the first, and by the way, this cover, yeah, which is an amazing cover. When you open the cover and the first splash page, it's pretty much the same. They're in mm-hmm. different positions, but yeah. it's pretty much the same these days. Yeah. You get a cover mm-hmm. and the inside doesn't even have that scene. Like it, no. it never even appears. There's nothing no. that has anything to do with what's no. inside. We, the we work so book. far in advance that my editors call me and say, I need a cover for champions 12. I'm like writing champions nine. I don't know. <laughs> Let's have Ms. Marvel fight a dinosaur and then I'll figure it out as I go. All right. Here's how you can tell you've got a really nice copy of a silver age comic. Cause you hold it by the, the corner and you just shake it a little bit. And it makes that it makes that noise. It makes that sort of like fake thunder noise. Shakespearean thunder. That's right, because it's really tight and it's really a brand new comic. Brand new comics don't do that. Everybody my try it. Yeah. Everybody Get out your Silver Age comic and try it. Your nice shiny new comic. Yeah. And I don't think it works with new comics. I think it works with slips out of your hand and yeah. falls on the ground. The first cover, the first comic that I remember. We're um, not talking about you, John. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> Go I mean, ahead. But um and I'm saying it like this because you're going to tell me what number mm-hmm. it was. It was a world's finest comic. Mm-hmm. And on it is Batman and Superman in costume. Mm-hmm. And they're being held in a in a prison by these Nazi soldiers. Yeah. And Batman is like chewing on a like a chicken leg or something. Yeah. He's starving. And Superman is in chains and looking at him. And the, and the soldier is saying like, you know, like he he's basically saying you can eat yeah and superman can't and batman is like i had to give up all the information yeah because you know i'm starving yeah and superman is sort of like uh, you jerk like, yeah. Yeah, yeah how could you do this yeah. so there's world finest issue number 194 there we please go. come on what is this a, <laughs> this is not amateur <laughs> hour <is it>? yes <laughs> that and i remember you know we didn't have a lot of money in yeah. when i was a kid and we so we ate sparingly sometimes and you saw Batman chowing down. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I got that comic, and I yeah. was like, oh, they're hungry, too. People eat a whole they're, chicken? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come on, Batman. Yeah. Let's share. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's the, first, that's the first one that I remember picking up, and it, it, you know, sitting on the floor and just being, like, gobsmacked. That by was 69. It. And you were how old? Well, I was born in 71. Okay. See, so oh, she got it. So like I a, had it. Yeah, it was a. It was in a bag that my uncle brought over, oh. and it was at the bottom of the bag. Those are the best uncles. Oh yeah, there yeah. was that, and then in the same bag yeah. was the other DC Comics, which was a, a detective comics with mm-hmm. seventies detective comics, with Batman on the cover reaching for a gun, and the villain is saying on a screen, "We all know the real Batman would never pick up a gun." Ah, uh, yeah. So pick up the gun. Yeah. Because he's been saying, you know, like I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm right. not Batman. Right. That's four eighteen. Everybody knows that. But still, <laughs> four four nineteen. Somewhere right. along in there. And and I, you know, for me, mm-hmm. uh, it speaks to it. You know, like Batman doesn't Batman hold doesn't guns. Care. He doesn't like care. Why his parents were killed by a gun? <laughs> the single the single thing you have to know about Batman is he doesn't use guns. And and he's smarter than that. If I my parents were killed by a car, I would have hesitation getting behind the wheel of a car. <laughs> Oh boy! Of course, yeah. these days, if you uh, you know watch any, it's, let's not even get into not that. Get into, just let's yet. not get into that. Let's not get into that yet. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the the you you every single year mm-hmm. from the 80s, mm-hmm. or early 80s, when you went to Fanographics and you were doing you know you're writing articles, or even before that, Amazing Heroes, yeah. you're writing these these articles, yeah. these um, columns, fan, fan press, oh, right? Fan yeah. press. Every year, there was another. Job, another job, another yeah. job. What was shocking looking at the the sort of progression of everything is that that has continued. I, I don't get it. All the way to present day. I don't get it. That is not false humility. I don't get it. Nobody gets a career like this. No one. Jumping from company to company. Yeah. Uh, book to book. Mm-hmm. Hero to hero. I mean, creating heroes along right. the way. But really, just playing with every toy yep. that anybody has. 32 years, and I have never once had to pick up the phone and call an editor and say, hey, I need a gig. Never. And again, that's not, I'm not bragging. I'm just, I'm saying that because I'm amazed. I mean, and this, I just, 
people ask me all the time, how do you get that career? I don't know. I have no idea. I mm. feel like the if like coyote, if I walked off the don't if you walk off the cliff, don't look down, <laughs> then you'll fall. Like don't ask the question. Um, but I've I've always been lucky to have plenty of work. At some point, parents were alive. Yeah, you know they were alive during the time that you were you know making yeah, a name. I was for making yourself. a name for myself. Yeah. Was there a time where your one or both of your parents walked into a store and picked up one of your books and purchased it? My my dad did that. My dad, I think my dad still does that on occasion. Mm. And for my mom, not so much, but they all respected that I took this turn in life. Nobody mm. gave me the place where it bit me was 97, I want to say 96, 97. My friend Tom Pyre is a writer as well. Mm. He's a great writer. Uh, he knew people who worked at Parade Magazine, which, if you know, was the insert. I don't know if they used to even published Parade Magazine. It was the insert in Sunday papers. It was right. the magazine insert in Sunday papers across the nation. You know, And it's full of stuff that nobody wants to read. It was full of ads for Sansabelt Slacks <laughs> and <laughs> letters going, hey, whatever happened to Bobby V? I, and this, is, this is in the 1980s. You know, <laughs> So Parade Magazine, but it went out to, at that point, millions and millions and millions and millions of households. And they did an issue every year, I don't know if they still do, where they talk about what people make in terms of salary. Mm. Like, just to give you some sort of comparison, this is what this random firefighter makes in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And this is what this stenographer makes in Memphis, Tennessee. And that, just to give you an idea of what's happening across the nation. Mm. So that had been a very good year. That was the kingdom come paycheck years that was a very good year right and my friend tom said i can put you in touch i know people i can put you in touch with a guy who does this and he can use you okay well and i thought okay not because i'm want to crow to the world Mm. but more that i thought two things first off i thought okay everybody in my family will now understand that this is a real job right and secondly no one is going to read this thing because it's full of ads for Sansa Belt slacks and, <laughs> you know, and, and make your own final records. It's like no one read this. Comes out by Sunday afternoon, phones ringing off the hook because it turns out they picked a certain number of people for the cover of that magazine. Oh, boy. And I'm on the cover. Oh, okay. And it was a very good. It was like a $200,000 year. <laughs> and that was a really good year. And so, so a comic book writer, you know, makes as much as the president of the United States. Oh, shit. <laughs> and so not only is the phone ringing off the hook by friends and relatives, like, what the hell? But then here's, here's my imitation of every convention I went to for the next two years. I'd be walking through the dealer's room. I'd pick up an old comic for sale and I would go, hey, this looks like, can you, can you do a little better on the price? No. <laughs> no, I cannot. <laughs> So that I regret that. That was a tactical mistake, but everyone in my family knew it was a real job at that point. Not to mention all of the editors uh, in, in every publishing company calling and going, Jesus, I've got like 3,000 people I trying know. to get into my office. I now. know, I know. I got, I got all these freelancers going, <laughs> why am I not making that kind of money? Yeah. Okay, so you've talked at length about... I've uh, talked. I've just talked at length. Talked at length. Yeah. But you've talked at length about Superman the movie, what yeah. it's meant to you. Yeah. Obviously, it meant a lot it meant to a me, lot. too. And then it changed your life. That level of hope and mm. wonder, joy, and um, sincerity. Earnestness. Yes. Um, that came out of that movie and what it did for, boy, for everything that followed. Yeah. At least for a while. For a while. Do you think that, okay, let me put it a different way. Like right now we've got Wonder Woman that's right. in the in the theaters and it's doing very, very well. Deservedly obviously. so. Yes. Yes. The one that, that they're getting right. Yeah. You know, Wonder <laughs> the one that is about superheroes. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's about hope and their homages to Superman, the movie, yeah. and their messages in there yeah. that are that are really all about the earnestness yeah. of that we expect yeah. from from comics. And one of the things, you know, I was looking at some of the previous quotes that you have given, and this, they could be completely wrong because I got them from the internet. <laughs> but one of them was superheroes were created to represent the best in all of us. We should aspire to match their nobility, not their ability to shoot big chrome guns. Absolutely. Superheroes were created by two kids from Cleveland, hmm. Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, who 
imagine something bigger than them, something stronger, more powerful. It's Tarzan and Hercules all rolled into one. Hmm. And from the start, that character was a champion for the little guy because that was their way. 17-year-old Jewish kids with no power in the world, and this hmm. is their way of projecting what they wanted, a way of them making it right, even in a fictional setting, right? Mm-hmm. So this character does the impossible. That's what care. That's what superheroes are built to do. They're built to do impossible things. Hmm. The first time we see Superman ever, the first time the world saw Superman, he was picking up a car and smashing it on a rock. It's Action <laughs> Comics number one. Not only had no one ever seen anything like that before, and it's impossible to imagine that in today's day and age. Yeah, but, yeah. but it was such an incredibly unique and out of the world, out of this world image that the publisher looked at that cover and said, that's just too ridiculous. We're not going to put Superman on the cover for the next six issues. We're not going to put him on the cover at all. <laughs> he's like, he's going to be buried in the back of the comic. And then he starts going to the newsstands and every news dealer is telling him it's the comic. With, what's selling? The comic with Superman on the cover. Mm-hmm. That's what's selling. That's what's sold for me. And so they, he reversed positions like issue seven and eight, somewhere along in there. But the point being that no one had ever seen anything like that before. Mm. Just he did the impossible and that's what we need to aspire to do. I mean, we can't we can't succeed, but we can try. I don't want I don't want to know what superheroes would be like if they were just like us. Right. I want us to be more like them. Mm. They are fictional characters. They are they do impossible things. They have an impossible moral code to stand up to or to, to, to equal. But that's what you want out of these characters. They are aspirational characters. Right. And the interesting part of someone like Superman is that the powers of a god really just wants to be one of us. Yes. Is fascinated yeah. by the idea of being normal. He could just, exactly, he could be Superman 24-7 if he right. wanted to. But instead, he puts on glasses and a, and a hat <laughs> and goes and, and works the Daily Planet. And they don't see behind the glasses because, and I mean this, journalists and I've been one, are the least observant people (laughs) in the world when it comes to their own sphere. Right. Outside, they're picking up all kinds of stuff. And I swear to you, in the newsroom, everybody's on his own. Everybody's in his own little world. So, um, yeah, that's what Superman wants. It's Imagine, and we're jumping all over, but that's it. Yeah, that's that's what I wanted to do. That's what I love about Superman is imagine living in a world that is made of cardboard and glass because that's Superman's existence. Mm. Everywhere he goes, he has to be careful not to do something that could hurt someone or damage someone. He can't play pickup basketball. Right. You know, he can't, he can't even help you move furniture. Like, you know, he, he just, he's got to be very careful. He, he is very careful. He doesn't, he, you know, he's got it pretty, he's got his act put together pretty right, well by right. now. But still, in order to think about the distance that would create hmm. for you as a, as a, as a person, how, alone that would make you fit you're unique there's nobody else like you in the universe right and you can't even interact with people without either worrying that you're going to damage them or that they're going to be afraid of you right, because right. the only way to deal with that is to 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 like Zeus and the gods you mm-hmm. go put on a human costume and you go live among them and enjoy living that life and being able to relate to them in a way that Superman cannot. Yeah. Going to man of steel with my daughter. And again, I know you've, you've, you've written we've, that link. We've covered this. Yes. yes. Um, but, but there was a segment, uh, everything I see now it's through her, her eyes, yeah. the lens of her eyes. What she said afterwards was, I wish the whole movie were about Clark Kent. I know because he just wanted to understand us and do good things. Yep. He didn't even care if, if people recognized him. There no. was somebody that was in trouble, and yeah. he saved them. Well, two or three times, right? But, but if the, your name was in the credits, the, but the but the point is that that's what spoke to her as okay. a child. Yeah, is there someone who really wants to be one of us? Yes, and yet has the the strength of a god. Right. Here's the way I see it: back when Action Comics was coming out, even. All through the period where the 60s, -hmm. the Silver Age, the 70s, to a certain extent, the Bronze Age. You get a book like that at a newsstand. Right. And you read it Mm -hmm. in the park or at home or whatever. And you're imagining what it was like. Other than going and talking to your friends about it. Right. All you're doing is imagining. Yes. 
There's no internet to get on. There's nope. no cell phone. There's no, all it is is I'm sitting and imagining yeah. what happened, what would happen, what would I do. What, I'm, I, I'm looking at a hundred little pictures in a floppy paper book. Right. And I don't, and I have to imagine not only what happens before and after, but I get to imagine what happens in between the pictures. I get to mm. imagine what happens in the gutter between the pictures. Right. That's, that is, that's why comics were such an amazingly interactive medium, mm. which you don't normally think of. But you think when you see your interactive medium, you think, you know, which way book or something right, like, or, right. you know, uh, or, you know, Call of Duty. No, comics are that too. Comic, you're just you and the comic. Yeah. When you're writing, yeah. because, it, you know, a hundred panels in a 22 page comic, yeah. generally. Ballpark, yeah. Are you thinking between the panels? I mean, you're thinking panel, 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 but yeah. are you, you, you love to edit as you go. Yeah, I do. So are you thinking? That's a good question. I, I think I am because it's, it's just important for me to know. It's not important for me to know what the action is on the page. Mm. It's important for me to know how the character is progressing, how the character is feeling, what the character is going through. Right. And so I have to think that character through as I go. There was a short story I remember in Astro City that Kurt Busiek did where the Samaritan has this yeah. day. Everybody remembers that story. That's the one story everybody remembers. And again, they're great stories, but it's a, a, Kurt would tell you, every, that's the one story. It's because it's, it really touches a nerve. Yes. It speaks to, to everyone who goes... What would wait a minute? Yeah, because that's a he takes a Superman analog basically, just yeah, a, you know, it's Samaritan, and he again. What would that? What is a day in the life of that guy really like? You can hear everything. You can hear everything. And how do you say no? Yeah, and you can't cover it all. How do you, so? How do you reconcile with that? And, yeah. and how do you reconcile with the fact that every once in a while you get you put on glasses and a suit, and meanwhile there's a volcano exploding and crack you know <laughs> Krakatoa is going off somewhere. <laughs> You have to find your boundaries. That's really, uh, it's also kind of says something to people who, when we all try to be good. Yeah. Most of us. Most, most of, us. of us. And do the right thing. But we can't always do the right thing and we can't always do the right thing for everyone. Right. We do the best we can. But, you know, throughout the day, it's what you learn from comic books, mm -hmm. these morality tales right. that we have, good good and evil, mm -hmm. is that you do the best you can. But there's a dark side to that. And it comes into play, especially for kids like me who read nothing but comics and just <laughs> fell into that world, is that all of what you said is true. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. All the ethics and morals that I learned from mm -hmm. comics that most kids growing up learned from superhero comics. Invaluable. Invaluable teaching tools. Especially as we start to get into the 80s and the 90s where Everything becomes more violent. All media right. becomes more violent. It's a place where heroes exist. But the selflessness with which all of the superheroes must, by definition, act, mm. total self, always putting other people first under any under all circumstances, it is a lofty goal. But to adopt that in your personal life becomes not only impossible, but it, it it's it 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 becomes a an, an issue. I mean, it's, it's, mm. you know, we've talked about this before. You can't healthy self-interest is an important part of the human psyche. I mean, every, if you, if you're not good with yourself, if you're not taking care of yourself, how do you take care of others? And there's, right. and there's ways to do both. You have to, the good people do both. Right. You take that taking care of yourself part out of the equation and you're just left with, I'll worry about my life later. I'll take care of these other people. Mm -hmm. That sounds very noble, but it, in my case, certainly yeah. bites you in the ass because you're not taking care of yourself and you're not, and therefore how much help can you really extend to others? There's a whole, we could do a, a whole nother podcast on the things I learned that were good and the things I learned that were sort of debilitating hmm. about when I was reading comics growing up. We look back on, you know, the villains mm -hmm. of the Silver Age right. and the Bronze Age. There was something to them, like Lex Luthor, really, honestly, it wasn't just that he was mad at Superman. Right. There was also another thing, and that is that everybody's paying attention to this other guy yeah. who's like this alien from yeah. space yeah. and who just shows up one day right. and everybody like treats him like he's, he's a god. Right. And yet he could kill all of us. Yeah. So who's going to save the day when that happens? That's true. It's not a, that's not a Silver Age conceit, but yes. But that's a modern day conceit. But yes, that's a, that's a realistic 
look at how people would react to superheroes. Sure. Yes. And maybe people back in the Silver Age didn't think that way no. and didn't see it that way because it was just like, uh, you know, I, I don't like him because, you know, I'm bald and I right. want to. Put, also, you know. also, they're fable. They're fables for ten year old kids. Right, yeah. right, right, right. Uh, but now Luther doesn't hate Superman because he made him bald. Right, right. Okay. The whole another podcast. <laughs> but yes. But now with 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 you know modern comics, there's so little to work with. Yeah, you're treading the same you know water right. uh, over and over again, the same material, but it's telling it in different ways. But you're speaking to an audience. Mm-hmm. That is moving at such a fast rate. Yep. And seeing things that are you cannot unsee right. on a daily on basis. On a daily basis. And unlike any other time in history, challenge everything. Yep. Whether they really believe it or not. Right. Just because that's what you're supposed to do. Exactly, yeah. So unlike a letters page mm-hmm. where someone sends in a letter and says, you know, you kind of said he instead of she right. or congratulations on this really great issue. I kind of I really liked it a lot. I spoke right. to my friends about it. Right. What you have is mm-hmm. thousands of posts mm-hmm. and emails and Twitter, yep. you know, and the Twitter feed yep. and Facebook and all yep. of that. Yeah. All of these people who, f- you know, feel the need to comment. Yes. And say their opinions. Yes, they and do. Most importantly, I think, look for the bad. Oh, unquestionably. And call you out yep. for it. Comics is a unique medium for many reasons. But one of them is that we are, in terms of entertainment, we are probably the most accessible people behind the entertainment. Mm. I mean, you can find comic, you can get a hold of comic book people anywhere. Yeah. You know, good luck finding chris evans you know good luck right. finding your favorite musician finding you know you can maybe send an email at, at their fan site but you're not going to hear back but comic guys you know we're out there and so that's both good and bad that's great because we get the immediate you know the, the immediate feedback yeah. and then we get we get to go to conventions and we get to be rock stars for a weekend it's awesome and then but then you get the death threats right i there's, mean you literally no get the death wall. threats exactly you get the and if you choose not to believe any of the bad stuff and believe only the good stuff, mm. well, then get, come on. Then that how valid how valid is the good stuff? Then right, you know? right, right. These death threats, yeah. which are real, which are real, when you're not the only one. Who no, gets I, them. I, you could throw a stick at a comic book convention and find a pro who's not, been. Yeah. Not to mention the women in comics. Oh my god, it is so much worse. Extraordinary, yeah, extraordinarily awful, yeah. things. And the filter is just no. you know, it's impossible to filter all of yeah. it. Yeah. I know women who have gotten death threats, comic book writers, female comic book writers who have gotten death threats at their house. Like, they know where you live. They found out where you live. That's just, that's creepy as hell. Right. And I think that it's hard for people to imagine. It's a, it's a, it's a comic book. Why would you? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And the, just the idea of it, imagine you're not a comic book writer out there. You're, right. you're just, you know, doing your thing. You work in an office. But imagine going home. Mm-hmm. And there's a death threat in your mailbox yep. and someone has said something extraordinarily awful to your wife mm-hmm. and your child is afraid because yeah. somebody said something yeah. to her at school. How is it that we disassociate ourselves from, oh, you got a death threat. Yeah. Oh, right. You know, <laughs> yeah. whatever. Oh, another. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. You know, somebody said they were going to, you know, come and break into your house and right. do awful things to you. Over a Jughead comic. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So... You've gotten off of Twitter, at least yes. for now. For, for the, until I can find enough sedatives to get me back on. Yeah. <laughs> but has it felt good? Yes. Oh, God, yes. Oh, God, yes. It has felt so good to be off Twitter because it's just, you don't realize until you get off, first of all, how much time you spend on it. Right. And then secondly, just the, barrage, the constant barrage of, yes, a lot of good messages, but also a lot of bad messages. Right. And a lot of people who just think you're, how dare you voice your opinion as a comic book guy or it just so much hate and it's getting worse and worse. It's not endemic to comics. I mean, we're just, we're an angry society. We're right. getting, we're getting angrier and angrier because we elected a toddler in chief. It didn't help things. Right. And we just become more divided and more angry. And it shows up in, I'm sure it shows up in every office in the, in America. I'm sure that that division, I'm sure that that mutual dislike for each other just shows up everywhere. So the, the noise uh, of it, the, the, yeah. As a writer, yeah. <laughs> you're taking in all this noise. Yeah. And you're the type of person that 
you know, you have a thing about bullies, and you say it a lot. Yeah. I don't know if in school, back when you were a kid. No, it was, actually, it was a shrimp. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you actually experienced. Oh, God, yes. That. I know I did. Yeah, all for every day. Yeah. So back then, did you back down? Did you walk away? Did you pick up your books off the floor and yeah, just go? Yeah, just book my book off the floor and go cry and be upset. Right. Because I was, right. again, not only... Not only a shrimp, but like, like I said, a couple of years younger than everybody else in school. So right. that didn't help you. And I was the egghead. I was the genius boy, which again, not. And I read comic books. So right. it's, it's, it's strike after strike after strike. And I talk about this often yeah. at some point in our lives, because certainly in the 70s, and I was experiencing all of that. And there were cool people all around me. Right. And I wasn't one of them. Right. Somehow along the way. We became the cool guys. Yeah. I, it's amazing. And everything changed. We won. Thank you, Walking Dead. Right. Thank you, Walking Dead. Yeah. There's your keystone moment. That's the one they're going to be looking back at 25 years from now. And right. Going, that right. was the when Walking Dead became a TV sensation and started literally driving people into stores in a way that no other movie or TV show for a long time had in terms of, you know, what we do, the yeah, geek yeah. stuff, the nerd stuff. I just opened the floodgates. And that's worldwide because I was just in, in Paris Show and off. going into the sh- right, name dropper. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I was, I was in the bookstores there and whether it's bookstores or comic book stores, there's sparse collected graphic novels that have been translated. Yeah. Certainly kingdom come has been translated into many languages Woo-hoo. and I actually saw it on the shelf. Nice. I was there walking dead. Yeah. Huge, huge shelf space. Yeah. In every store. Every store. Translated into yeah. French. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure Spanish and yeah. Italian. Oh, yeah. There. It's a worldwide mm-hmm. sensation. Yeah. And you're right that it did change culture quite a bit. And it, someone comes into a comic book store because of Walking Dead. Mm-hmm. And they go, wow, there's a lot of stuff yeah. here. Yeah. There's a lot of things to read. And I've been in your store. And you and Harley, your employee, they both know to go. Okay, what what are you interested in? What other what besides Walking Dead? What other things do you read? What other kind right. of things do you like? What other shows do you watch? You just steer them around the store. Yeah, it's the hey, what should I read? Yeah, and I go, who are you? Right, tell me something about yourself. Otherwise, yeah. I just otherwise I'll just hand you Saga, right. which you probably do anyway. But yeah. <laughs> I do, I do. Yeah. Most yeah, it's a it's it's got a really high rate. Yes, of it does. Love that's the Sandman of the of the aught teens whatever true. it is yes that is very true it is the gateway drug sandman was the gateway drug you could not find a young female comic book fan in all of the 2000s that what that didn't come in through sandman yes yeah and even now i mean my daughter just read sandman for the first time oh. and she ju- it just really struck her that's cool that it holds up it does, and especially with her being someone who's fascinated by literature. Yes. And and all through time and all the different and seeing, wow, this issue was written in Iambic Pentameter. Right, yeah, exactly. This yeah. this yeah. entire issue. How did he do yeah. that? And yeah. how did they let him? Comics aren't supposed to be like that. No. At that time, At that it time. was pretty, yeah, pretty well, yeah. revolutionary. But so, you know, being that as a kid when you're growing up and you're you're getting into an industry where you get to be an adult and make money doing yeah. this thing with comic books that yeah. you love, you're now at a stage where you don't have to allow that to happen. If somebody throws your books on the ground, right. you can actually call someone out. I call them out for it. it. I, and I do. I yes. just, I really do. And it doesn't make me a superhero. It doesn't make me necessarily even a good guy. It just It's just, that's what I learned from superheroes and that's what i learned from uh, you know also being treated that way you don't treat right. people that way it's the you, the golden rule every civilization in human history has at the core of their belief system some minor variation on the golden rule do unto others every civilization does ever since the dawn of time that we ever in recorded history that's the human condition that's the fundament of how you should live and i i yes i call that bullies on the internet when mm-hmm. I when I see them attacking other people or, or when I see them just being jerks and a lot of times it gets me in trouble mm-hmm. and a lot of times I get the calls from companies going yeah maybe you should just tamp it down a little bit um, and in fact that's kind of why I pulled away for a little bit because yeah. I've, I've started to I've been advised by yeah. close friends that I've started to get the reputation of oh cranky old man Mark Wade I don't right. like that so but it's important it's important to do that
The Blast Off Podcast is produced by The Colonel, Jeff Fox, Scott Tipton, and me. Original music is composed and performed by Derek Anthony Gray. You can find more of his musical compositions on his website, DerekAnthonyGray.com. For more information about anything you've heard us talk about today, check us out online at BlastOffComics.com. We have an active Facebook presence, so check us out over there on Facebook. And you can reach us on Twitter, at BlastOffComics, or on Instagram. Or you can come by our retail location in North Hollywood in the heart of the Arts District, 5118 Lancashire Boulevard in North Hollywood, just two blocks south of Magnolia. See you soon.